Welcome back to the Blister and Muck podcast. I'm Jenny Mason, your host and the creator of the Blister and Muck series. Last week, Blister earned a whole muffin. No doubt he's feeling confident. But all good things must crumb to an end. Blister still has to locate those secret agent spy pigeons and solve Muck's sudden disappearance. Hopefully in this episode he doesn't suffer any setbacks. You may not be surprised to learn that I love words. Some people call me Rapunzel. Okay, no one calls me that, but they really should. In truth, I don't just love words because you can flip or spin them into puns. I love the way some words feel, splashing or rattling around the mouth. Pelagic, zibeline, pungle, senescence, flotsam, scumble. I love the way some words sound exactly like what they mean, like oleaginous, which means oily, or tatterdemalion, which describes a ragged, tattered appearance. Some words forever change your view of the world. For example, pinniped refers to all thin-footed animals, like seals or walrus. But the pin in pinniped comes from the Latin word pinna, or feather. So these sea creatures have feather feet. They don't swim so much as fly through the big blue liquid sky we call the ocean. Some words are more than words. They are an entire spider web of ideas. The farther you trace those words back in time, the more you see their influence spreading out. To know these words is to know something about the whole of humankind. For instance, the word sidereal refers to stars and constellations and the rate at which the Earth moves through space and spins relative to them. Sidereal comes from the Latin word sidus, or constellation. Its cousins are considerare and desiderare. Considerare means examine, investigate closely, or consider. Desiderare means to gaze at the stars, and also to long for and desire. We are a species deeply influenced and shaped by our consideration of the skies, by our perpetual stargazing and our desire to know what's out there and why. The more we gazed at the stars, the deeper our desire grew to travel to them and swim, or fly, through that sparkling sea until one day we created a rocket to take us there. See how easy it is to fall in love with words? And yet, there's one word I can't fully fall in love with. I can barely manage mild politeness when it comes to the word should. You should go to bed early. Should is the past tense form of shall, a word handed down to us from languages much older than Latin and ancient Greek. Shall seems similar to will. I shall go to the ball, or I will go to the ball. In fact, the two words are very different. Will arises from ancient words for choose and wish. Shall means ought to. You shall do something because you ought to, or you must. You owe it to someone or something. And it's this obligation, this check on personal freedom or free will, that irks me when I hear the word should. Once upon a time, people believed that women should only take care of children and see to the household tasks. That was their duty and obligation. People also believed that women should not go to school. They should not have jobs. They should not play sports. They should not vote. These were the prevailing shoulds back in the 19th century. Luckily, plenty of activists fought to overturn the old shoulds. And I am sure you're seeing activists today still fighting to overturn the shoulds holding people captive. Fighting to make a will world. A free world where we can stargaze. 
a wish world where we can fly away on our own feather feet. Episode 11, The Woman on the Bridge Day had stretched to the other end of itself by the time Blister staggered out of the caverns under XS Capital Bank. As he nibbled the remaining muffin crumbs off the paper baking cup, he uncovered delicate print proclaiming the bakery's name, Le Petit Gâteau de François Fillette. Merci beaucoup, François, Blister said in his best French accent, and patted his bulged belly. He used the paper cup as a napkin before tossing it aside. He surveyed the neighborhoods. When he did not see the cats he called Tabby and Slackjaw, he began a slow, leisurely stroll home. Blister had waddled out of the banking district and was about to take a shortcut through an alley when he stopped. Dr. Van Sangfroyd's electric traps might lurk in that alley. He shriveled, remembering the putrid, weather-beaten pelt in the silver mesh cube. Blister had all but erased the nuisance from his mind the minute he passed the information on to Madame Putresca. Telling somebody else made the problem somebody else's to deal with, did it not? Blister searched for alternative transport, but the sight of bouncy carriages and swaying bustle bows nearly knocked his contents loose. He was too full to ride as a passenger. He resumed his stroll, but charted a homeward path which avoided any and all alleys, even though that meant dodging hooves, shoes, and wheels the whole way. Ticks and maggots, he complained. Up ahead, on a footbridge crossing the blight spill ring finger of the Black Rust River, a crowd congested. They gathered to see a parade of suffragists march through crepuscular quarters, murk gate and bleak ford. The vibrant sashes slung over their dresses were embroidered with slogans like Votes for Women, Equality for All, and Rebalance Society. Some carried signs painted with similar slogans. Other suffragists marched while playing musical instruments. Flutes, Fidi Dalid. Trumpets, Paul Wampatud. Bass drums, Boom Doomy Boomed. Dog packs careened through the streets, barking, Run, run, run! And fun, fun, fun! The onlookers mingled jeers and cheers. Whether the sentiments were for or against the music, for or against the cause, or for or against the dogs was difficult to discern. Blister tucked out of sight on the undergirding arched beams supporting the bridge. Better to wait for the parade to pass than risk getting squashed under all those marching high-heeled boots. As the parade passed by the bridge, the flutes trilled, Fee fee dee da li da. Hello, blue rat. Hello. This salutation issued from above. Cautiously, Blister peeked over the lip of the bridge. He saw a woman crouched down, calling to him. The crowd was too focused on the parade to notice her, and had anyone bothered to look, they would have seen nothing out of the ordinary. Just a woman stooped down, perhaps to retrieve something she had dropped. But to Blister, she was everything out of the ordinary. First of all, her attire was outlandish. The fabric of her dress and broad-brimmed hat resembled iridescent snake scales. Claw and fang fasteners studded both the dress and hat. Feathers of all kinds lined the collars, cuffs, hems, and hatband. Second of all, she was talking to a rat, neither shrieking nor cursing, nor spitting nor stamping. On the contrary, she wanted consultation, discussion, some kind of symposium. Once in a bygone era, a more mystical, magical time, people regularly spoke to animals. They consulted them on the weather or the future. They worshipped creatures and beseeched them for help, knowledge, and blessings. They wore animal pelts, 
danced in rituals and drank potions designed to give them animal cunning and beastly powers. But those habits faded as humankind's tools and technologies tamed the world. And people no longer considered themselves as animals, subjects in the animal kingdom. They were superior. All other creatures were inferior and not worth chatting up. Of course, every rule has its exceptions. Rare individuals existed who would converse with creatures, despite living in a modern city, on a modernizing continent, adrift between modernized oceans. Evidently, this woman was one of them. Blue Rat, come here, she urged. Downy wisps of her unruly red hair escaped from the tightly pinned bun. The trumpets struck up a metallic cheer. Pa, 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 wampa, ta, pa, pa, wa. Blister retreated under the bridge. Like any intelligent rat, Blister knew never to trust people. When humankind gave up consulting and worshipping animals, they took up blaming creatures whenever world events went awry. Quite often, they blamed the wrong animal. For example, wolves were rumored to be werewolves who spread their cursed condition to people. The real curse was rabies, and bats were the actual culprits causing most of its contagion. Similarly, rats were hated and blamed for carrying the bubonic plague around the world hundreds of years ago. The real culprits? Gerbils, who carried the fleas harboring the horrible disease. When Blister moved out of sight, the woman entreated. No, please, stay. My name is Yana. I have a gift for you. From her handbag, she removed a wedge of cheese wrapped in crinkly paper. She set the cheese on the lip of the footbridge planks. Blister did not retrieve it. It's not poisoned, I promise, she said. She broke off a corner of the cheese and ate it. Pledge of good faith. Blister's heart hammered through his fur, but not because he was afraid. He was frustrated because the parade blocked not only his escape from this peculiar woman in a snakeskin dress, but also his shortest route home. To backtrack and cross some other bridge meant traveling after sunset, when the wharf rats emerged. His other choices were equally unappealing. He could cut through alleys, where Dr. Van Sengfroyd traps lurked, or he could hitch a ride and risk upsetting his very full stomach. Doom, 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 boomy, doom, warned the bass drums. What do you want? he asked. I study animals. If you would let me study you, I would give you more food. Think about it, and if you decide you'd like lots of yummy food, come by my townhouse. Number four, Atrimental Avenue, in Adumbral Fields. After that, she rose up, tipped her hat, and curtsied politely. She proceeded away from the crowd and the noisy parade, her snakeskin dress seeming to slither through the city's traffic. Cockroach casserole, Blister spluttered. Has the world gone mad? He inhaled the buttery aroma of the Havarti cheese. Yana did not have to eat a piece to prove it was not laced. Even over the raspy, sour moss breath of the blight spill, he could smell the clean creaminess of the cheese. For the first time in his life, Blister wished he did not have an entire muffin stuffed in his gut. If only Muck were here, he sighed just before he clamped his paw over his mouth. I did not just say that. Blister snagged the cheese wedge and its brittle wrapper. The parade concluded, clearing his way forward. En route to the cathedral, he detoured behind a grocer's shop, which Scab and her rat pack staked off as their territory. Only they, meaning primarily Scab, could enjoy the spoiled fruits and vegetables tossed there. A concert of greedy crunching, slurping, and burping played inside a rubbish bin swarmed with gnats and flies. Hey, Scab! 
The bin shook as several rats peered over the rim. Scram, blister, Scab snarled. This is our turf, Snot warned. Don't get your whiskers in a knot. I brought you a peace offering. Blister displayed the Havarti. The rat pack, minus scum, hopped out of the bin and surrounded Blister. He didn't bother making inquiry into scum's whereabouts. There was only one reason a street rat would not be with its pack. You brought us cheese? Spit asked. Gag snorted. I bet it's laced. What do you mean, peace offering? Scab asked. Remember that apple? The wood you stole, Grimes said. I won it fair and square, but I felt bad for being faster and smarter than all of you, so I brought you this. The rats postured around the cheese, as if around a tarantula. Something must be wrong with it, Scab decided. You'd never give up a gorgeous wedge of cheese once you got your greedy paws on it. Blister patted his fat belly. I have had so much to eat today. I just don't have a smidge of room for this. If you want it, great. If you don't, leave it here and let the wharf rats get it. He left the rats ringed around the creamy cheese. I'm telling you, Spindle, if those dung-for-brain rats don't eat that cheese, I'll... I'll... Blister paused long enough to light two candles in the bell tower. I don't know what I'll do, but they'll be sorry for wasting food they didn't earn. Just as he had done that morning, Spindle clawed at the same cluster of candle boxes. Still after that beetle? That's what I like about you, Spin, Blister said. You know the value of earning your meals and not letting things go to waste. Candle flames brightened the bell tower. Blister climbed up into the window and watched the night stain the ocean. Just like the night before, Black Rust's power supply faltered. Electric lights across the city winked out. After a while, they blinked back on. It has been a strange couple of days, Blister said. Maybe the strangest of my whole life. First all that popcorn, then a whole muffin, and then that weird lady giving out free cheese. I feel about as stuffed as Muck looks. <sighs> he sighed. Where do you think he is? Spindle chewed on the corner of a box. Do you think he's okay? The spider drummed his legs impatiently. Spindle, that's enough. Whatever bug you're chasing is long gone by now. The spider ignored Blister. He resumed digging under the stacks. Okay, that's it. Blister stormed over to the cluster of boxes. He moved Spindle out of the way and then shoved box after box out of its place. See, Spindle, nothing there. He said this before he registered the buttery blonde rat crouched inside a hollow gap between the remaining stacks, grinning sheepishly at him. You! Surprise salutations to you, Muck said. When did you... how did you... why did you... oh, never mind. This isn't a hotel. You can't come and go as you please. I did not come and go. I deferred departure early this morning. You mean you've been hiding there all day? Muck crawled stiffly out of the cramped hollow. Spindle ascended Muck's legs and roosted on his shoulder. Muck grinned. Quite a cunning contrivance and devilish design, if you ask me. Cunning? More like simplistically stupid. Blister crossed his arms over his chest. How long did you think you could stay hidden in there? How were you going to eat or sleep? Well, I suppose I would have... Um, I might have... Uh... Muck wilted when he could not muster the answers. Time to go. 
Blister hooked Muck by the armpits and cargoed him to the stairwell. Spindle leapt away from the jostling struggle. No, please, Blister, don't make me go. Not at night. Not with the wicked wharf rats coming out. Muck dug his heels into the stone floor. He wriggled and shoved back. You had grr, all day to find her grr, a place of your own, Blister grunted as he pushed the heavy rat onward. I can't help grr, that you wasted that time. Retaining my own residence grr, is irrelevant, Muck grunted as he resisted with all his might. Unless I learn her superlative subsistence skills, grr, if you teach me. I would give you a portion of my provisions. Blister dug his head between Muck's shoulders and shoved harder. Muck's feet slid within an inch of the first stair. A segment of all my servings, Muck exclaimed. Blister heaved his whole body against Muck's weight. The inch shrank to half an inch. A measure of my meals! Muck's toe claws slid over the stair lip and into the curtain of darkness cloaking the stairwell. Food! I'll give you food! Blister relaxed a bit. How much food? A third of all my meals. Blister resumed shoving. Okay, okay! Half, half of all my helpings! Blister abruptly relaxed and strolled away, leaving Muck to topple forwards. I'll take that deal. I'll teach you how to survive in the city, but as soon as you can fend for yourself, you have to promise to leave. Deal? Blister extended his paw. Deal, I promise. Muck locked his paw around Blister's. Spindle zoomed circles around their feet, then perched on Muck's shoulder. That was a close one. Muck barely sealed the deal when he agreed to give Blister half of any food he finds. Badder late than never. Will he succeed in Blister's survival lessons? Will he find the path of yeast resistance? Tune in next week. Until then, you can always stop by blisterandmuck.com. Did you know I share links to cool articles, recordings, and books tied to the many topics we cover on this show? And you can use the contact form to tell me what surprised you in this episode, or what some of your least favorite and most favorite words are. If you click the subscribe button, you'll get an email from the Blister and Muck producers as soon as the newest episode releases. This show is 100% listener supported. I always appreciate it when you tell a friend to listen along. Everyone can find the show on Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and just about anywhere else. Special thanks to composer Roland Rudzidis for serving up the Blister and Muck theme song. Additional music from Mon Plaisir. Dave Insamas brought the marching band. Mike Koenig provided the electric fizzles. Every day, every week, I am grateful for my family, friends, and fans. One for one, and all for you.